Welcome to WebAssembly, your monthly podcast to geek out about all things WebAssembly. I'm your host, Thomas Steiner, and this is episode two of the show. After the first episode with Alan Zakai, I again have a very special guest today, Deepti Gandluri. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So Deepti, you chair the WebAssembly community group at the W3C. You're a member of the WebAssembly working group also at the W3C. You gave the opening keynote at the WebAssembly Summit in 2021, and you joined Google in 2014, working on V8 and WebAssembly and its standardization. That's a lot of WASM in your work life, but I think you have an electrical engineering background by education and worked at Intel before joining Google. Can you tell us a little bit more how you got into WebAssembly? Yeah, so um, I think uh, from the early days, even in school and uh, when I started working, a lot of my interests uh, did lie in computer architecture. So I don't have a computer science degree, uh, but I did a uh, minor in computer engineering. Uh, so a lot of computer architecture, just um, instruction set architectures, uh, memory and how caches work, all of that good stuff. Um, at Intel, um, I actually worked on a simulator, which was used as a pre-silicon validation tool um, that used to, th that supported instruction sets dating back to Pentium 5 to all of the instructions that are going to be up and coming. So that was a really interesting experience for me because I get, I got to, you know, play around with instructions that have been around for a while and even some instructions that don't actually make it into the hardware. Um, and so when I started at Google, I actually started on the native client team um, and, uh, you know, was starting to work on the validator. Um, and how I got started in V8 actually is, is kind of a fun story because because I uh, started out as um, experimenting with SIMD.js uh, in its early days. Uh, that proposal didn't make it into the JS spec, but we took a segue into uh, having SIMD operations supported in WebAssembly. So um, it's a, a lot of my early work uh, was actually in a V8 and implementing uh, WebAssembly features. So Atomics uh, supporting the MVP features um, and also uh, some implementation work for SIMD. So this is so even though it, it kind of sounds uh, sounds separate from the things I'm working on, a lot of what I've been doing is just one abstraction level over uh, over the hardware. That's amazing. Um, sometimes I wish I had more idea of like what SIMD at a processor level actually means. Like there's cores and stuff, but like I'm a JavaScript developer by heart, so. I don't really know much about like the processor internals and stuff, but I guess working on WebAssembly, this, um, does help. But before, um, before we dive into that rabbit hole, um, I just wanted to start with, um, standardization. And, um, so you're active in both the community group for WebAssembly and the working group, and both are at the W3C. Um, so for those who are not really super deep into, W3C and standards and how the process works and so on. Like, why is there two? Why is there a working group? Where is there a community group? What's the difference? Do they work together? Um, are they competing? Like, what is the difference? What, how does it work? Can you tell us? Yeah, of course. Um, so I, I will say first, uh, right off the bat, that they're not competing in any way. They're definitely very collaborative. Um, the, the, to, to kind of understand how this works for WASM, I do want to explain a little bit more about community groups and working groups in general. Uh, community groups are open to all. Uh, the intent of community groups is that they have a low barrier for entry. It's, it's, it's a place w that can work as incubation, uh, for new technologies. And then you would move them into a W3C working group to iterate, and the working group um, actually generates the technical specs, uh, candidate recommendations, and any um, you know any official spec uh, spec documentation that comes out of standardizing uh, uh, a feature. So for WASM, uh, this is intentionally different. In the early days, uh, there was an intentional choice to make sure that uh, the barrier for entry for anyone wanting to be involved in WASM standardization is low. Um, so a lot of the work is actually done in the community group. Um, and I know, you know, we can talk about this more, but the WASM phase process is a five phase process. So everything from the initial incubation to all the way up to almost standard and, you know, making it into the spec document happens in the community group. And then it's handed off to the working group to 
standardize and uh, merge into the official spec. Uh, I'll also say one thing, uh, which is which is kind of an interesting thing. I know you've mentioned a couple of times that I co-chaired the WASM CG. I have done that um, since mid 2019, but I'm officially transitioning out and Thomas Lively uh, is going to be stepping in for me as the uh, as the co-chair going forward. And then there's the Bytecode Alliance as well. So there's also a ton of companies. I think Google is not part of the Bytecode Alliance, but was it sometime or something? Um, so how, how does that play into the, the whole standardization effort? So, um, I think that Bytecode Alliance is, is somewhat separate in terms of, uh, you know, they are kind of looking at that, that is a collaborative framework for a lot of the folks working on WASI and runtimes and, and sharing some of the knowledge across the board. Um, with Google's involvement, I think, uh, a lot of Google's investments in WebAssembly have been uh, towards the web and not outside the web. So um, we did join the Bytecode Alliance because there was a research team uh, that was looking to engage more closely and their membership lapsed. So there was never any intentional, you know, we want to join the Bytecode Alliance or we want to leave the Bytecode Alliance uh, to, to be you know, perfectly frank with you, we actually work with a lot of the people in the Bytecode Alliance in the W3C community and the working groups. Um, so, and, you know, we respect them highly and there's, there's definitely no friction there. It's just, it's just two separate entities. Back to maybe the working group and the community group model. So you mentioned, um, the barrier for entry is super low for community group, um, members or potential members. Whereas for a working group, I think you need to be part of um, a W3C member organization, which I guess can be relatively expensive for, I don't know, startups or something. So um, is it that, for example, if you are a small startup and you specialize on whatever VASM feature um, that you want to land, you can financially, because you are constrained for whatever reason, maybe wait, well, because you're a startup, um, you can start in the community group and still um, meaningfully contribute to standards? Is, is this how it works? Or like, is, is there another way out for, for people who are like not as financially well than, um, yeah, you maybe need to be? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you make a really good point about the, the membership criteria for working groups, which is you do have to be a part of the member organization, but, uh, for academics and other folks, there is another way uh, to be a part of the working group too, which is you can be an invited expert. So if you do have a lot of deep knowledge or are a researcher working in WebAssembly, we have done this in the past where we've, um, had those folks on as invited experts. But, um, you know, for most of WASM standardization, um, I, what, what we usually look to for the working group is, is kind of a stamping uh, entity to make sure that our specs are merged, that we're following the official uh, W3C process. But a lot of uh, WASM, actually most of WASM standardization happens in the community group. So if you're a startup or, it, um, you know, if you are an independent uh, contributor that is looking to have a proposal for your own use case, um, there shouldn't be too many barriers for entry. And it, there's also nothing that mandates you have to be in the working group. Obviously, it's a, it's a bonus if you are, but um, there's nothing uh, that would hold you back, uh, especially being a part of the standards process. I see. And um, so you mentioned it before very briefly, um, the stages model. So um, JavaScript uses a stages model as well in the TC39. TC um, but I looked at both and they seem a little different. Um, is, is there like, what, what is the core difference? What, what makes um, VASM's stage approach different from the TC39 approach? What is What's going on there? So um, the WASM uh, phases process actually pulls quite heavily and inspire, is inspired by uh, the TC39 stages uh, model. The, there's two key differences in my mind. Uh, the first one uh, being the WASM consensus model. In TC39, you have to have absolute consensus to move something forward. In WASM, what we do is actually um, have folks vote, and then you know you move uh, proposals forward, and then the chair determines uh, what consensus can look like. Um, the other thing that I think is critical to mention is, especially when we go to phase four, um, the entry point for phase four is to say that two uh, production web VMs have uh, implemented the feature. And I think that's... that's Phase four would be the final phase when it, when it yes. uh, becomes a standard? Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. And I, I can talk a little bit more about the uh, uh, about the phases process itself. Um, so phase one is is kind of the incubation phase where, we, uh, where someone has an idea and they want to invest more of their time into pushing that and, um, you know, try to experiment with it. So phase one is 
when th- I'll give you more of the unofficial, unofficial model that's in my head and not maybe what's in the documentation. But phase one is usually the model where the CG uh, looks at a feature and says, oh, this is an interesting problem and the CG should care about solving it. Um, phase two is uh, where you really like the entry to phase two is the big entry point is design consensus. So this is to say phase one, we've, you know, we do think this is a good problem to solve. And phase two, we have concrete approaches or APIs or instru- instructions that work towards solving uh, that problem. Um, now, phase three is the implementation phase. So for when you're getting to phase three, what you should have is, is a, a, a good, good set of spec tests that say, Oh, I, I do have, you know, I, I, I know what the feature is. I know what the API is. I know what the instructions are. And I do have a canonical test suite that will run against, uh, s- something to say, yes, this, this, this is, this, uh, this makes sense. Um, phase three is where the bulk of the implementation happens. So, uh, in web VMs and pr- other outside of web VMs too, like I'll just use the word production, uh, production VMs here, but, uh, e- experiment with the feature, start to implement it. And, uh, phase four, the entry to phase four would be that you do have the full spec text available. You do have, uh, you know, multiple web VMs that have implemented the feature. I think a big part of this multiple VM, multiple production VM requirement is to make sure that we're not, you know, Shipping a lot of Chromium only features or shipping separate browser only, a different browser only features, or that we're all able to give that kind of consistent, uh, feature set available to developers. So we're not, you know, we're not putting them in this, in this world of pain where, uh, different browsers don't support it. Obviously we do get in that, in, in that state for various reasons because that's some, sometimes how uh, web standards work. But I think the intention is to kind of, lessen that burden on developers as we build that into the process to say, yes, this is, this is a feature that is supported on more than one, uh, web VM. Is there a strict requirement that it has to be more than two, more than three, more than four? Like on the web, for example, um, for web standards, it has to be two different independent browser engines, which is kind of interesting because we have Chromium and then we have all the browsers that built on top of Chromium, but they don't count as, um, yeah. separate browsers because the engine is the same. Yeah, that is true. I mean, I think we do have to have two independent. So, um, it would be, for example, a lot of proposals we've seen move forward, uh, with an implementation in Chrome, implementation in Firefox and implementation in Safari. Uh, early on in the process, uh, we did have Edge, uh, participating too, but now as Edge is a Chromium browser, uh, a lot of our work with them is collaborative and not necessarily, uh, counted as an independent, uh, VM. So standards in general have a reputation of being kind of slow. And um, yeah. it's not unheard of that standards would take several years from the initial idea to then the fin- finished um, final standard. So I have worked a bit on standard- standardization of um, what we call um, yeah, Project Fugu APIs, so advanced browser APIs that allow you to do um, new things on the on the web, like access your files um, using the local file system a- API, for example, or a hardware APIs. Um, like web serial, web USB. Mm-hmm. Um, so in these discussions with uh, other browser vendors, um, yeah, sometimes they say, um, this is a use case. Yes. Um, but like, why do you want to solve it on the web? So there's a lot of like skepticism sometimes for some of these APIs when it comes to other vendors. And, mm-hmm. um, the discussion is not so, so much about the how, but more about the um the why like why even is this a problem worth solving um mm. looking at how it works at vasm it seems to be a lot more like a joint effort in the sense that everyone agrees on the why and people um yeah from the start work more on asking and wondering about the how question um would you say that WebAssembly and like compared to other standards that you might be aware of is relatively fast when it comes to um, standardization by whatever um, definition of fast, or would you say it's still kind of slow and um, yeah, you yeah. Could, could go a lot faster if uh, um, yeah you were not bound by standardis- standardization? It's it's a very loaded question. I think <laughs> you know that there's, <laughs> yeah, there's definitely um, you know. Our standards fast is, is, uh, I think the usual answer to that is depends on who you ask, right? Uh, for people that are waiting for the feature, um, you know, it's standards are always going to be slow. Um, I think 
it's just, especially with Wasm still being in its early stages, um, I think that it is expected that um, some features or, or some proposals do take a lot of time. For example, uh, when you have proposals like uh, like smaller self-contained proposals that you can turn through quickly, like a sign extension uh, proposal, for example, that should be, you know, that should be something we should all be able to implement fairly quickly and move through the standards process. But then you have something like the GC that talks about type systems and, you know, type systems of different languages and what are the languages we want to support. And by definition, that could, that, that just has a lot more constraints and a lot more design space to think of. So it does take uh, longer to figure out exactly what to do about something like that. But I think you are right that, um, a lot of the conversation around, at least in the WASM CG, is mostly about how there's always some conversation about the why too, right? We talk about, um, you know, why do we do certain things? And like, if you do have an API, is this, is this relevant? Does this have to be in the core spec? Can this be solved in user space? Those are all of the questions that do come up, uh, really often. But, um, I think that there is a part of the process that is quite intentional. Uh, previously, I talked about design consensus at phase two. So at phase one, we do answer the question as, is this something that the WebAssembly standards group should solve? And, you know, when you, when you handle that question really early to say, is this an interesting problem? Should someone be investing their time? I think we're all also fairly aligned on the why. Um, and the other thing is like, especially when it comes to design consensus to say, okay, we want more concrete ideas on what the scope of this proposal is, what it's trying to address and how, how the CG should think about it. So there is like the, the two bits of it that says, why are we working on this proposal and how do we intend to solve the problem that is intentionally built into the process? So I think that there is, it does come with more of the, yes, we're all aligned on solving this problem from the entire CG. So there's a little bit of shared understanding. We set a shared goal to say what the scope of the proposal is. Um, that said, um, I, I think it's really hard <laughs> for me to call any web standards process uh, fast. I, I know there, there, there are groups that do this more successfully um, than uh, the WASM CG does, but we, you know, we're continuing to work on process improvements in that space to uh, when possible. And also, uh, especially when there's a big proposal, it's not unheard of to split it off into multiple smaller proposals. We've seen this uh, for the thread subgroup uh, for the uh, threads and atomics proposal. We've seen this for GC. We continue to, you know, and this is always like kind of one of those tools that we can use to say, oh, this proposal is too big in scope. And then we could slice it out into um, more manageable proposals, so to speak. So can you give us maybe a, um, a ballpark number? So for something like garbage collection, GC, that you mentioned before, um, from the initial, someone had the idea of having it uh, in VASM to the thing becoming an official standard. How many months, years, weeks, decades are we talking? I would say that we wouldn't go all the way up to decade, but it would be in terms of multiple years. Um, I would say that that um, a lot of the time, you know, that the time from inception to the time to completion isn't necessarily an accurate representation of how fast it moves. I mean, it is an absolute measurable unit, so I can see the temptation to say, yes, this is this is how long this entire proposal took. But uh, that that's not always the case because I think the CG has a limited set of people. Um, there are, you know, all engine implementers are limited in terms of resources. So a lot of this is also based on prioritization. Um, so we do, for example, the GC proposal from the inception of WASM, this, uh, this was going to be post MVP. So it probably, you know, was a thing everybody wanted to do at some point of time in the future. But in the early days, there were a lot more things that were higher priority to make WASM more compelling to build on top of MVP uh, for performance, for, you know, user use cases. Like a lot of early days of WASM were all targeting C++ and Rust code. Um, so, you know, that, that was an explicit choice. So it doesn't, you know, I know that GC took maybe longer, but that was also because a lot of the people involved were working on other things at the same time. So definitely not, not hopefully not a decade, but also uh, in the matter of years, but not weeks or months, I think is, is, uh, <laughs> is, is somewhat unrealistic. But I do think that we're trying to streamline the process in a way that, especially for smaller compute extensions or, you know, things that are is fairly well scoped that we uh, work through them in, in a matter of months and not years. Um, so back to where 
um, we both work, which is Google. And um, also the VA team is uh, part of Google's Chrome organization. Um, yeah. With WebAssembly being anchored so deeply in the um, browser world organization-wise at Google, do you think um, this is a problem, especially given that WebAssembly is becoming more and more um, attractive to use on the server as well? I don't think that this is a problem. Um, I mean, a fun fact here is that a lot of us who work on um, on WebAssembly, on the WebAssembly team, on the Chrome team, are actually pretty big champions of um, outside of the web uh, web web use cases of WASM. We do follow a lot of the work closely. We don't actively invest in it because you know that's not uh, a part of our charter. But we are cheerleaders of that work from far away. Um, I don't necessarily see that as a as a problem. I do see you know, there is obviously a chance of the ecosystem bifurcating. And I know people have a problem with that. Like, does that mean that we're replicating work that can happen outside of the web and the web? Are there APIs that we can share and do this more consistently? So there's always that conversation. Um, for that, I think we're still maybe a little bit early in that, in that pipeline to see, you know, what does it look like for the web? For example, you mentioned file system APIs a, a couple of times. Uh, the web already has a good set of file system APIs that exist. And, um, I know, uh, you know, especially built on top of WASM, that is something that's being actively worked on in, 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 in different subgroups. So there, there's, there's a little bit of contention because the web is quite stable and there's a lot of APIs that have existed and work really well. Um, so it's, you know, they, I think in, in some cases, especially with growth, um, you, I would expect the ecosystem to fragment a little bit. But in my view, my very personal view that this is expected and normal, and it's actually increasing kind of the diversity of applications uh, where uh, WASM can be used. So I, the other thing that I do want to say is, especially our team on the Chrome side, we do a lot of consulting work for other folks um, that work in cloud or um, in, in other parts of the organization that are investigating WASM. And we try to redirect them to the right folks um, at, externally if, if needed. But, um, you know, we, we continue to keep our eye on it, especially as the team that has a lot of WASM expertise. Uh, we are, we attempt to be as proactive as possible in lending that experience to our other colleagues at Google. I want to talk about file system a little um, more. Yes. Um, but before we dive into that, um, I just wanted to more generally um, ask you, as the chair of the community group, um, you get to see a ton of proposals and I guess all of the proposals from the inception, like from the, hey, I have this idea um, where someone opens an issue maybe. Um, and you get to see all those until they are a final standard or until they are yeah, becoming inactive, canceled, abandoned, whatever. So my next question is actually three questions in one. And um, I will remind you if you forget get uh, in between um, because each of those can be easily a rabbit hole. Um, so yeah, the threefold question is, um, what is your favorite feature that you wish had made it through the standards process, but didn't? And then what's your favorite feature that currently is in the middle of the sentence process and on a hopeful trajectory. And then finally, um, what is your favorite feature that did make it? So um, a feature that made it from inception to full standard. So yeah. abandoned, midway through, and then finished. The feature that I'm most sad about that didn't make it through the standard process is uh, feature detection. Uh, we've taken multiple stabs at this. We've, uh, you know, tried uh, exploring feature detection in terms of uh, operations that we support or the opcode space. Uh, we've uh, talked about feature uh, feature detection in terms of conditional compilation, uh, custom sections. There's, we, we, we've really talked about this a lot of times, but a lot of the feedback we've gotten from the CG is to have a consistent approach to feature detection across different uh, proposals. And I think this is really hard to do, just given the nature of the proposals, right? We have compute proposals that are just like a small abstraction over um, instructions that are provided. We also have GC or type reflection or JSPI, which are at a completely other, you know, at a completely higher layer. And, and, and I think there's not a good solution that would fix both of these problems at the same time. Um, now, um, 
you know, this is definitely a case where we've gotten into this, oh, perfect is the enemy of good, where we could actually do something uh, small and self-contained for the proposals that we have or for the proposals that need it so that users or developers don't actually have to ship multiple binaries uh, for each feature set. Or, you know, it, there's really a lot of bloat there when you think of it, because uh, a lot of these features aren't consistently supported across browsers. I know the process tries to make sure we do that, but that's not always uh, realistic. So we do get into this where applications sometimes have to ship like a combination of features. And then there's like, it just, it kind of adds a lot of bloat versus if we were able to do this natively in, um, in, in, in Rasm, that, that's something that I think would be really compelling. Um, I know this is this is a long question, so I'll I'll, I'll, I'll remember what the next part of this is, which is uh, before we go into this. Um, at the risk yeah. of actually digging uh, into a rabbit hole, so coming from JavaScript, where you have feature detection for a lot of things, especially like when you look at advanced browser APIs that may only work in one browser but not uh, other browsers, um, a core thing we do with feature detection is always conditional loading. So um, you see like, hey, um, does the browser support feature X? And if so, you load the JavaScript that does feature X. Um, looking at WebAssembly, I think one of the things that would be missing for this kind of conditional loading would be some sort of um, MASM native module support or something. So um, is this on, on the radar for feature detection as well? Or is, is this one of the things that you mentioned where you just uh, have to touch so many things that, yeah, it becomes um, in incredibly complex. So, I mean, I, I think you touch on an interesting thing, right? Like, I, th I think both of those things are true where, um, where the way we're actually, the way applications look to port WASM code is that you compile using mstripton and you get a large binary module blob. Um, and now that's great for, you know, for several reasons, but it's not great to figure out exactly what, um, you know, you, what, what features are supported? Like we have tried this, uh, not in terms of loading, but in terms of conditional compilation where, uh, you have some information up front to say what features are supported. And then while validating or decoding, you look through what sets of instructions you would uh, compile or not. Um, now that, that works for some things, but again, it doesn't work for probably proposals that look at modifying control flow. Uh, like, you know, if you have stack switching or exception handling, that's particularly hard to do in that type of framework. Or if you have GC, for example, that's fundamentally changing the object representation and what you can do in WASM. So that, that doesn't always fit into that model. So it's, you know, it does go into that. It, it, it isn't quite as straightforward just because the usage model of WASM in, in, you know, the tool chain pipeline where you get like this entire binary blob. Um, it, it's quite different from, from, from JavaScript in that way. I know that we've kind of in this like kind of mod loading, we, I, I know there's like tooling solutions to that. Like if you were to split your module in different ways, if you were just, you know, we do have some form of lazy loading supported, but it's not, it's not quite um, at, at the same level of uh, JS, I think, that we would need some native primitives to say what feature sets are supported and not uh, to make a more consistent, um, consistent. One of the surprising things that I discovered in the JSPI, um, so JavaScript Promise integration um, proposal was that this can be sort of abused, if you will, or creatively used um, for lazy loading. So that's just unexpected, but um, yeah, I guess this could be one piece in the direction of getting where we want to. But yeah, of course, there's a lot of use cases where this is not enough. Um, but yeah, like, I don't want to go into too deep into the rabbit hole um, because there's uh, a lot more questions that I want to ask you. Um, so the next um, of the three uh, way question was, what is your favorite proposal that is midway through the process? Like that is that we're working on right now, essentially, as, as the community group and working group. It's uh, funny you mentioned JSPI because that that is top of mind for me right now, and that I think is 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 uh, one of my favorite proposals in how compelling it is in in the different ways that it can be used. Right, um, you know, we've talked about um, we've we've you know you just talked about lazy loading, but you it, it's basically like if you step back, a way um, to have you know to circumvent some of the asynchronicity of the web itself um and we've seen this come across in multiple ways whether it's for file system apis whether it's for gpu apis that want to synchronously map but they don't have primitives and a hacky way to do this is i mean i wouldn't call it hacky because we do support this natively and we're hoping to support it natively um but i do think that it's really compelling where it opens up a lot of performance and um opens up 
you know, m- more things that you can do. It basically aligns more of this, this native C++ or uh, native programming model of synchron- synchronous code to the web's very asynchronous event loop based model, which can be hard to reason about, especially when you're trying to bridge the gap uh, between the two. So JSPI for that, I find uh, really compelling. I know, um, you know, we, we, uh, you, you talked alone before and uh, Asyncify was able to do that, but it did not having native support does come at some form of a performance and code size cost. So we really are looking at eliminating that uh, with JSPI. Uh, we've seen some really early results that are compelling, especially when uh, when when you mix that in uh, with WebGPU. So there's, there's definitely a lot of interesting things in terms of JSPI, and that's the one I'm really excited about. Um, we do have a full prototype. There's a live origin trial. So, you know, for anyone listening in, please go experiment with it. We, we have a couple of blog posts out there a lot of information about JSPI. Um, so that's definitely the one I would somewhat consider my favorite. There's a lot of proposals to pick from in a, in a, for a lot of different reasons, but I do think uh, JSPI is is uh, really quite uh, compelling right now. And it's one of the more approachable ones, especially when you come from a JavaScript background. Um, yeah. I will put the uh, link to the blog post that we have into the show notes so you can read up on it. Um, right. So the final question then is, um, on like the final question of the three way question. Um, the final question there is, um, what is your favorite finished proposal? I think my, again, I, I think a lot of my favorite, uh, proposals are based off of how compelling the feature is. So it is funny for me to pick a favorite feature that I have worked the least on. So in, in this, in this context, <laughs> it would, uh, definitely be a garbage collection. I think that there's, there's, so much potential. We just shipped it last year. There's so much potential uh, for adoption. I know that um, language toolchain authors, for example, are working on top of uh, on, on top of the existing implementations, both in the runtime and in Binarian, um, to kind of do some of this. Um, you know, to, 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 to make that more widely available. So just this whole compelling thing of you could write in any high level language and still be able to run code on the web. Uh, it's, is is amazing. There's also the fact of shared business logic that you would have one core bit of your proposal and that that would be shared. Yeah, we will definitely do a show on this. Um, I've already someone on the lineup for talking about shared business logic. So this is very exciting. Um, I want to come back to um, one thing um, that I mentioned before, which is this tension a bit between um, WebAssembly as a like web language and then server. So let's say um, I am part of the community group and um, I have this amazing idea and I suggest something that only ever makes sense in a browser. So let's say I suggest, hey, it would be amazing if WebAssembly had DOM access. And I guess um, someone has already made this uh, proposal in the past, but um, I just take it for it's uh yeah very natural um yeah you can only have uh, a dom in the browser there's no dom on the server um so how would the community group react to something like this like how about all the server people would they immediately zoom out and say wow that's nothing i ever want to get involved with uh, in like how how does this work so this is something i really like about the process that it's really collaborative i think there's a lot of acknowledgement of different ecosystems having very different needs and that there's not um you know people don't usually hold back uh proposals in terms of what they you know in in terms of whether that's useful for their ecosystem or not uh the other thing that i want to emphasize here is the spec model right um there is a core spec uh, of WASM, which is, uh, we, sorry, the layer, the thing I want to emphasize is the layered spec model of WASM. We do have a core spec that holds all of the basic features that should be applicable across ecosystems. Um, and then we have layered specs. So we have the JS, JS spec or the web spec. And these are, you know, especially DOM access or JSPI, for example, is going directly into the JS spec. Um, so there's not a lot of contention in terms of Oh, if this is a feature that's going into the JS spec, a lot of people would actually provide useful input, both current and previous browser vendors to say, we do see the use in this, and this is probably how it should be spec. So a lot of the conversation still is kind of around how these things are spec and not, um, you know, questioning the intrinsic value, because a lot of the things that we are working on do have intrinsic value. Um, now that said, there is some contention too, right? In terms of if you have a threads proposal that looks different on, uh, in the WASI space or in, in 
you know, in the in the browser space with worker based uh, threads model. Um, so a lot of what we do in this case is actually split out into subgroups, have all the, you know, have all the relevant folks involved and hash out what should live in the core spec. What should live in the APIs? What should live in WASI? What should live in the user space? Um, so there's a lot of just effort into making sure that we're maintaining these consistent layers where the core spec actually has something really useful. And then the layers on top of that, um, uh, have, have, um, you know, it, 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 it's, there's a layered approach that where features or, um, uh, or the relevant things go into each of these layers. Yeah. WASI is actually a good gateway into my next question, which, um, Mark's the end of this uh, three-way question, so <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> um, so when it comes to WASI, um, like on the browser, there are certain mm -hmm. things that you just don't have naturally compared to things on the server. So that's kind of flipping the question around. On the server, you don't have a DOM. Um, mm -hmm. In the browser, you don't super naturally have files, so at least not cross browser. So people have done files in the past for WebAssembly, like mm -hmm. in IndexedDB or in memory purely um, emulated. Um, there's the OPFS, the origin private file system that is cross browser now. So you can actually get uh, access to files. Um, you can have the file system access API to open actual files on the uh, users user visible file system, but this is not cross browser. So when it comes to features like that, where um, Vasi has file system access, makes a lot of sense, um, would be super useful. But then of course, yeah, on the on the browser, files is kind of a different thing than on a server where files are a lot more natural. Um, how, how does that work? Is, is there a way for something like the um, Vasi um, WebAssembly, um, I think systems interface is the latest, how um, the acronym is spelled out? I'm, you're yeah. nodding, okay. Um, so how, how is that supposed to work on the browser or at all? Or like there's a polyfill that is sort of abandoned, I think, or like where, where are we with Vasi on the, on the, um, browser? I think one of the things I will say right now, um, this is, this is probably something I'll say with my Chrome hat on, which is to say that especially when it comes to Wasm on the browser, what we really encourage folks to do is, uh, use the web APIs that are already available and work well. So you mentioned file system APIs. I'll also mention web crypto, for example, or, um, you know, web codex. There's a lot of APIs that are really powerful that, uh, natively support features that are compelling for the web. And I don't think that Wasm is a replacement uh, for that. But I do think that WASM can be a fallback path in terms of, oh, if I have like a crypto algorithm that web crypto doesn't support, then, you know, compiling that using WASM's 128-bit support is a good way to do that. Or, um, you know, if you have codecs that are not supported, for example, by default, then there's ways to use that, uh, ways to use WASM uh, to compile that and make it available on the web. Um, now you, you bring up an interesting thing, which is this contention between if there are APIs, uh, that exist on, in the WASI space and they don't on the browser, like what, do, what do we do about that? I think my answer to that is just right now we do nothing. <laughs> there is going to be tooling. I mean, I think this can be solved by tooling, right? Um, you polyfill is, it is abandoned, but that's also because I think WASI is somewhat early stage in terms of, um, you know, it's built on top of the component model. It is probably, you know, there was a breaking change previously. So it's not something that you can directly use, especially on, in, in kind of the browser context right now. But that said, there is a lot of tooling and polyfilling that I do expect will happen when the ecosystem is, is more mature and we're happy to support that. But right now, I think what we would encourage people to do is because there's, there's already a way to do this on the browser and Wasm is trying to fit into that. So we're not actually trying to do and have a new systems interface for the web. What we're trying to do is make sure that there's ecosystem consistency across the server and across the browser, but also, you know, use the tool that works best for you. So if you, if you are working on the web and you need USB access, web USB is a much better way of doing that because it is safer. It, it takes into account all of the constraints of the web, which are not the same as as in the service space. So one of the interesting proposals that I saw recently was um, the um, built-in strings proposal, where um, essentially the idea is um, JavaScript already has a lot of uh, st string methods. Let's just open those up directly to WebAssembly so that WebAssembly can sort of call into those JavaScript functions. Would this be a way, for example, to get um, like a 
reference for the built-in web USB API on browsers that support it so that WebAssembly could, from WebAssembly land, call into the web USB API. Is this something that the built-in proposal um, is technically capable of? So uh, the built-in proposal, built-in strings proposal uh, addresses strings only. Um, so, but, but you bring up an interesting point, right? This is a model that should work for other APIs, um, as well. Um, web USB in this case, I just, you know, I brought it up in terms of just a compelling way to use like hardware, uh, on, 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 on users devices. But, uh, but there is a way to do this. And this is actually something that we are working on, which is fast calls between WASM and WebGPU. Like, especially when it's, you know, latency sensitive, this is a thing that should be possible. And this is something that we could be doing. So we are doing this in some select cases where we do think that there are performance uh, gains to be had, for example. So fast call between WebAssembly and WASM is something uh, the V8 team is actively investigating. Um, so you are right that this model fits really well, but it also does, it, it comes with its challenges, right? It can be brittle. Um, you know, we want to make sure that when we invest this effort that it is, there is like a performance or other trade-off that comes with it. So there are cases where it's really compelling, like strings or uh, calls to WebGPU, but there are cases that are just not as, uh, as performance sensitive or don't really need it. Um, so when, when it, it is needed, I think I, I'm confident that we would invest in it. It's kind of funny as well, because like, I remember um, back when I was in university and uh, one of my computer science um, lessons, they taught us Java. And Java mm -hmm. has this way where you can call from Java into native uh, C++ code, for example. So this would be sort of flipping that around. So going from the um, more low-level language into the higher-level language for performance reasons. It's kind of super paradox, right? Or am I completely, completely misunderstanding um, what the proposal does? This is not a proposal. I mean, I think, I think, so I think there's ways to, it is, it is, <laughs> there's a, especially with spring built-ins, there's a lot of history behind it. I know we tried to do this with spring ref, which is probably a more ergonomic or clearer way of getting this, uh, getting this performance out. But for, for the part that I was talking about, which is like fast calls between WASM and WebGPU, for example, that is just like an implementation feature. We're not actually proposing this. And I, and I do agree that there's, there's a little bit of, a paradox here because you're kind of wiring two things together just to get performance. Um, it is awkward. I'll give you that. I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily have a have a have a good um, good answer for. It. Except it it is also really intuitive to me. Where especially as like as a software engineer, if I see something, oh, this is a performance hotspot, and how do I optimize this? Is kind of the approach and that's kind of how we got there and which is, you know, which we should, which is, which is the more reasonable thing to do. But it also, I understand the other side of this where this is, this seems like an awkward thing to do, especially when you're looking at like native calls plumbing out to JS and we're trying to abstract away uh, the layers uh, for performance. Yeah. So WebGPU leads actually into my next question that I have, um, which is a bit of a topic switch. Um, so <laughs> these days there's just no way around AI. So artificial intelligence, and um, WebAssembly with WebGPU is a super hot topic in this space. You were giving an I.O. talk, so Google I.O., um, Google's um, big developer conference that is coming up soon. And um, your talk is on WebAssembly, WebGPU, and enhancements for faster web AI. So that's a lot of uh, hot topics in there. Um, can you just, so without giving too many spoilers, um, can you just give us a quick rundown? What What is... Um, going to be in this talk. What are you going to talk about? What new WASM proposals will make AI faster on the web? Yeah, um, I think the the I'm actually giving this talk uh, with a colleague from the WebGPU team, Austin. Uh, so we'll both be talking about proposals and features that are being added to WebAssembly and WebGPU for faster web AI. Um, the 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 interesting thing here is that. Um, you know, the native and web environments are really different, right? Um, in, in native applications, you just have the full force of hardware and you're able to get like 
the bare metal performance uh, for your applications. And this is not always true, especially when it comes to web. And there's like, there's, there's reasons for that, very good reasons for that. But that also means that we're always in this tension of we want something portable, but it's not always uh, as performant as you would see in terms of your native applications. Um, and a lot of what I'll be talking about is, again, we've, you know, we've talked a little bit about this abstraction over the CPU. Um, and uh, so when, when WASM MVP first came out, it had like a core set of instructions um, that are portable across hardwares that are, you know, kind of used for key things, but it doesn't really talk a lot about compute, which is the baseline for a lot of AI applications. Um, one interesting thing that that is is also uh, something I should talk about is that a lot of web applications, um, you know, using inference on the web are actually running uh, to some extent on the CPU because WASM has been around for longer and is more mature than WebGPU, though I do expect that, you know, there's, there's going to be a little bit more movement that we see towards WebGPU and WASM will still be really compelling um, for, uh, for making sure that we're able to run everywhere. Um, so in terms of features, uh, when we look at, uh, when we look at WASM as an abstraction over the CPU, uh, what we're missing is actually just a lot of extensions that hardware vendors are continuing to add to hardware. So we're kind of frozen in time, maybe in 2017 or 2020, where we said, oh, we will expose, um, SIMD, the SIMD primitives, which is vector primitives. Um, I championed that proposal. I was, it was really excited to like actually have that ship. And it was compelling for a lot of reasons because it does increase a lot of performance. Um, it, it enables applications that weren't always available to be available on the web. But it's just not enough in terms of performance because it is, again, it is like an older, uh, older instruction set. It's been around for a while. What we're trying to do is just bridge the gap, but it, we are chasing a moving target because hardware continues to add new extensions. Um, so a lot of what I'll be talking about in, in that talk is how we're trying to bridge the gap, which is what new compute extensions we're adding. Um, so we recently added RelaxMD, ship RelaxMD last year. Uh, we are going to be working, uh, we are actually actively working on having FP16 support um, and hopefully even BF16 support in the future. So that that's like a set of compute extensions. But the other interesting paradigm here is I think um, WASM as an entry purpose uh, for special purpose compute on the web. So CPU is all general purpose compute, but um, GPU, for example, is a graphic processing unit. We are seeing a lot of neural processing units or hardware coming up with a lot of special purpose compute. Um, and we, we, this paradigm of WASM being the entry point for a lot of special purpose compute is also really compelling. So there's a way to look at it, which is just like, how do we optimize the whole application, right? Compute is only one part of the application. So JSPI, for example, is something that really fits well into that model to make sure that we're bridging that gap. Um, we're also looking at, for example, memory 64, which is just like, oh, this WASM 32 isn't always sufficient in terms of address space, or it only has 32 bit pointers. So having all of, um, you know, having all of the address space available to you and 64 bit pointers are also compelling. So uh, what I'm really interested here is about, you know, it's, it was, I'm still being a compelling target and also that we're continuing to add compute extensions for the web, especially if it's an M32 special purpose compute. There's, there's like a whole, um, there's a, there's a whole story here that I'll, I'll tell more in my talk, but, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the preview. Uh, the other thing I want to say, I know I'm, I'm probably spending too much time on this question, but, <laughs> but the other thing I do want to say is also that, uh, this, at least the compute extension, right? That compute extensions that go directly into the core spec, that's not really web or uh, server specific. It just lives in the core spec. So anyone, it's low level, it's low level enough that anyone who's building on top of the core spec, uh, would be able to make use of these uh, extensions. Um, it's also one of these things where WASM is so low level that, um, especially if it's not always useful, you know, it is useful for AI, but I do expect that to just be useful in general. Um, you know, you're just increasing compute, uh, that via WASM. And that's, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. It's interesting that this goes in both directions. So on the one hand side, you have memory 64, where, mm -hmm. um, you extend, um, the addressable, um, uh, bit space, uh, memory space by uh, 64 mm -hmm. bits. And then you have, uh, FP16, where you, um, reduce to a 16 bit, uh, um, precision only to make some of the operations go faster. So 
as I said, it's kind of like going in both directions. You, you know, yeah. decrease the precision, but at the other end, you increase the um, addressable memory space. Um, so for AI, like what, what is, what is the more important thing? Like what, what is more pressing to solve? Um, is it faster operations? Is it more memory? What is in general, like what, what is the core thing to solve? These are both kind of solving the same problem to some extent in terms of if you have, um, if you have large models, you need larger address space to be able to store those models. Um, if you have, you know, if you decrease the precision, you're actually able to store more. Like it takes, you know, less memory, less, uh, faster performance. So there's, there's, in, in, in my mind, they're kind of coupled together towards the same objective, uh, so to speak. But it is also in terms of what we're trying to avoid here is a lot of ML applications we see do extensively use, um, F16s for reduced precision. So when it is reduced precision, like the, these are not the same as codecs, which do need that type of precision. But for, uh, for ML applications, reduced precision is perfectly fine because it does give them, um, more speed, uh, less memory being utilized. So it is, uh, in my mind, both of these things are actually, uh, working towards the same thing. So if you have memory 64, it actually increases uh, the address space available to your application. And when you have uh, half precision values, uh, that means that you're using uh, less memory, have faster performance uh, to to even to store your values. Uh, but the other thing that I also want to say is, especially when you when your application solely works on F16s, and then you have to kind of convert back and forth uh, to F F32s because that's what WASM supports. That can be quite expensive because conversions can be expensive, and it also is very ISA specific. So something that is supported on Intel, uh, it 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 probably has slightly different semantics. So that does mean that conversions can get quite expensive depending on what hardware that uh, hardware you're looking at. So it's a little bit of both in terms of, yes, we want to increase address space. We want to make sure that we're reducing uh, memory, but we also want to make sure that it's operating well with the rest of the ecosystem. So if you have ML applications that are using reduced precision that they don't have to convert back and forth, or, um, you know, for GPU interrupt too, because I know GPU just uh, ship uh, na native FP16 support. So there's there's a lot of advantages to having uh, FP16s natively supported or half precision, you know, it can be FP16 and maybe in the future be F16 supported natively in WASM. Back to G web GPU for a second. Um, so something that surprised me a bit was um, people were expecting, yeah, WebGPU, and this will make VASM less um, relevant just because everything is moving over to uh, GPU. But then um, when you think mobile, um, a big, big part of the mobile phones that ship today, they don't have a GPU or they, they have a very weak GPU. So for the foreseeable future, um, I think VASM will still remain very, very relevant um, because maybe the high-end phones, they have capable GPUs. Um, but then when it comes to the bread and butter um, Android phones that um, I don't know my my brother has or our parents have. Yeah. This is going to take a long time until those devices will be gone and we will have GPU on like even entry level mobile phones. I guess until then, um, Basm will stay very very relevant. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I'll go back to this, which is just using the tool that's right for the job, right? Uh, if you are looking at an application that you want to be available everywhere or like you a lot of what um, frameworks for example have now is like a GPU backend and web GPU backend and a WASM backend so a lot of this is going to be at the application or the user level to say what is the right tool for the job um, and even in the case where there's broad uh, widespread GPU adoption there are still uh, models that are actually more efficient on the web so if you do have something like segmentation which is actually you know trying to figure out where your face is and you know that that needs extensive of compute, but if you are just looking at say, oh, I'm just going to split these images into, oh, are there two people and I'm going to split where they are, like those sorts of higher granularity are actually better done on the CPU. So there are cases where GPU bring up for smaller models can be much more expensive than just running them on the CPU. So it's, it's one of these things where you know, when you when you look at it on the surface of it, you, sh you want to say, yes, more compute, everything should run on the GPU. But the real uh, answer is much more nuanced in terms of what do you really want to do? What do you want to make available? Who should this application, what what sort of end devices this application should be able to run on? So um, 
definitely a lot of nuance in terms of that. And I'm also, you know, obviously as a WASM enthusiast, I, I do expect that it will be relevant <laughs> for quite some time going forward. I sure hope it will. Cool. Um, thank you so much for answering all uh, my spicy or not so spicy questions. Um, that brings us to the last part of the show, which is WASM, but not. So the way it works is um, I will ask you two questions that are WASM related, but not actually. And um, the first question is, when you, and wait for it, instantiate streaming, what is it that you are currently listening or watching when you instantiate one of your streaming media devices? Interesting questions. Um, so I've been, I've been, I've been a little bit on a wellness kick recently. So I've been listening to a lot of podcasts about health and well-being, uh, too. So if you, if you, if you put on a lot of my streaming devices, you will see a lot of podcasts, uh, based on that. Um, I, I think that. But but the other uh, on the other side, a lot of what I'm also trying to catch up on is is a lot of meetings that I I, I don't always go to, so I always have those recorded. Uh, so there is, for example, um, I didn't. There's like ML summits and other things that are especially talking about on device and performance. So I do end up listening to a lot of those on my drive <laughs> to work. So you'll you'll see an interesting combination of yes, I need to be you know I need to take care of myself and 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 focus on my wellness, but I also care. Quite about performance and um, you know, kind of keeping staying up to date with what's happening out in the world. Very interesting. I never listen to meetings only. So to be honest, it's very, very rare that I actually watch a recorded meeting. Um, <laughs> I would just rather catch up on the notes or something. And um, AI can help a lot with that when when you have like someone takes a lot of notes and you have twenty whatever pages of notes to catch up on and. Uh, yeah. AI can then quickly summarize it and you can get at least a gist of it. And then you can jump into the recording where you're interested. But like, yeah, listening to a recorded meeting on a drive. Wow. <laughs> That's definitely not something to fall asleep to. No, it's, it's definitely not something I, I fall asleep to, but it is something, um, I do feel like I've been doing kind of slightly different things, especially as I'm, as I'm transitioning out of my CG chair role, I'm trying to figure out like all the different things I'm focusing on. Um, so it, it is interesting, especially when it comes to summit talks or, uh, you know, summit talks or conference, uh, talks, for example, it, it doesn't always have to be purely meeting recordings that those, I, I will give you that they get uh, pretty boring, but <laughs> there is just like a lot of, uh, summits and I know WASM conferences that come across, uh, it just, it, it does seem to be like a good, good way to stay on top of it. Um, especially when I'm, it's a good context setting too. Like, you know, I'm getting out of the chaos uh, that is a three-year-old at home. And then I want to switch to my work mode and I'll start listening to more, uh, more of the things on my drive so when you when you watch conference talks do you actually um only listen to them or like do you sneak while you're driving at the screen to see some of the slides or i mostly just listen okay um it's, there, there are cases where i want to see the screen and then i might go rewatch but a lot of the times it's uh, at 1.5 x and i'm listening while working or while driving this is uh, then the final question here um yeah the local get global set question so if there's one thing um, that you could get from you locally, like something you do, and you could global set it onto the world, what would it be? I think one of the things that I have tried to do really intentionally is to at least improve the processes around uh, our standards processes or around making our uh, making the WASM CG much more accessible. Uh, to new folks, uh, making, you know, having really good uh, COC escalation processes. So just entirely making the process uh, better. Hopefully, I mean, I've, I've tried to do this uh, with some degree of success. Uh, I, you know, I, I do wish I had a lot more spend uh, time to spend on it than I did. Um, but I think that is a thing that I think as, as CG members or as people that do care about standardization, improving our process, improving our documentation is a thing that we should do um, just in terms of making pretty much everybody productive, making uh, standardization faster. That's the thing that we all benefit from, especially in this ecosystem. Yeah, this, this would be amazing work at, at all levels. Um, when you said code of, code of conduct um, violations or something, um, if you as a CG do, do this well um, and you could globally set this behavior onto other um, chairs of other working groups, other yeah. community groups where this maybe is just something they don't care about or they don't even know that 
a COC exists or should be nice to have on a on a repository or something. Um, this would be pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much again for coming on the show. Um, really, really was an honor to have you, and I'm very interesting to learn from you about all the things coming to Basm as uh, your chair role or from your from chair role in the community group in the WebAssembly working group. Um, looking forward to that IO talk. Um, we will put up the link um, once it goes live into the show notes. And um, yeah, with that, um, thanks again for, for being here, um, for listening. And um, if you want to come onto the show, um, you can find me as Tomayak on the internet, like on GitHub, on Twitter, on um, Mastodon. If you want to come onto the show, if you have something interesting to say in the world of Vasm, be sure to reach out. And with that, thank you so much. And um, see you, listen to you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for having me. Bye.